Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When people think of meaningful passages in the Bible, the many lengthy genealogies found in Genesis and elsewhere rarely, if ever, come to mind. Yet it is exactly one such passage, the genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew, that holds significant meaning for the Christmas season. Who are the people listed in the opening verses of Matthew's Gospel, and why do they matter? What is the purpose of Matthew's genealogy? Is the Messiah's pedigree relevant, or is something else going on? Join us as Richard and I discuss Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 49 of the Bible as Literature podcast. This is our Christmas episode. And we were talking and we thought, what better opportunity will we have to discuss the prologue in Matthew's Gospel, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. A lot of people are dying not to have to hear this long list of genealogies, but we decided it's important to discuss the significance of this chapter because it really is important the way that it sets the tone for the book of Matthew and the entire New Testament. Every year, As a child, I would hear adults complain about this reading. Why do we have to listen to a long list of names? I thought it was funny in the end because, as you know, I started off my book on Galatians by talking about how, as a young child, the recitation of this long list of names was formative in the opening salvo of my own journey to try to understand what scripture is talking about. So I think it's very important. And I think it's sad that people who consider themselves Christian or consider themselves to be actively Christian no longer view difficult texts like this as the main dimension of their discipline as a disciple of Jesus Christ. As an ancient Near Eastern text, having the genealogy is significant. The way that the list is formed, and I think the way that it's monotonous, is something that's important and formative because the fact that it's monotonous makes those things that don't fit stand out so much more clearly. The first reaction I have when I read it now is I notice the women who are mentioned because the women who are mentioned have significance on the way that we view this entire bloodline. That Ruth is mentioned in this bloodline is very interesting because Ruth is a Moabite who decided to enter into Israel and marry an Israelite to marry Boaz and who ended up being the great-grandmother of David the king. Now, those of you who are even more familiar with scripture understand that in the Torah, in the first five books, it says no Moabite may enter into the congregation unto the seventh generation, which means that David is unable to enter into the sanctuary. He is cut off because of his lineage. Again, it emphasizes what we've said all along following this concept that Father Paul Tarazi introduced of the storyline. You have to follow the storyline of Scripture. You can't take Matthew out of context or outside the context of any of these texts from the Tanakh. You can't even ignore a simple book like Ruth that on the surface seems insignificant, but actually is really essential to the point that Matthew's making here, and arguably the most important of the four Gospels. And the thing about the book of Ruth, if we can take a tangent for a moment to talk about the book of Ruth, the tension that the book of Ruth sets up is that Ruth, who is a Gentile, is living correctly according to Torah. She's taking care of her widowed mother-in-law. She is deciding because of her decision to take care of her to follow the God of Israel in order to be supportive of this widow. She's willing to sacrifice everything, even her own family and her own gods, in order to support this widow. And in order to do so, she then marries 
one of her distant relatives by marriage in order to then have a family. And that's how she enters into the bloodline of Israel. And so it sets up a tension. On the one hand, no Moabite is allowed to enter into the sanctuary. On the other hand, this Moabite is living precisely the way that an Israelite should. And so it sets up the tension. Is she an Israelite or is she not an Israelite? Perhaps a different question might be, perhaps the question Matthew is driving at, what is the difference between an Israelite and a non-Israelite? I think we all are guilty of imagining that there's a difference. Even people who claim that they see no difference when they talk about Scripture betray a kind of fundamentalism in which they still see the world through the lenses of who's in, who's out, who's your daddy, essentially. Mm -hmm. So let's follow through this flow. So we have this first section that's broken into three parts of the genealogy that leads to the birth of David the king. And you've explained this unique function of Ruth, who is kind of the fly in the ointment, as it were. Really? Yeah, exactly. So let's keep following the flow. So what happens in the next section? Now David is the father of Solomon. Right. So then we have David, who's the father of Solomon, by Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah. And technically in Greek, who was her of Uriah. That's what it says literally in Greek. So the fact that this woman was Uriah's already emphasizes clearly that David was an adulterer. That not only was he an adulterer, he stole the wife of a Gentile. He took a Gentile's wife in order to be the father of Solomon. What I'm hearing while you're talking is this famous passage in Hosea where God is threatening the clergy. Because you haven't preached the Torah, guess what's going to happen? The people are going to multiply in their harlotries and still not bear fruit. When you draw out this point from the actual names of David's misbehavior, that's what I'm hearing. So it subverts what theoretically someone writing a genealogy is trying to do, if David truly is a harlot. Right, and so that's the interesting thing, is that once you do this, you emphasize Ruth and you emphasize Uriah's wife by bringing in these women that stand out. They are precisely the women that are the fly in the ointment, as you put it, Father, and corrupting this line. Corrupting this puritanical, xenophobic idea of a pure line, which is a human construct, right? This is, I mean, this is Genesis again. It's trying to establish your line. It's this. It's man setting up fences again. But it's interesting because in the first section, you have David ascend to the throne. In the second section, though, which is really the fulfillment of David's go at it, you have suddenly the deportation to Babylon. So typically when you have these kingly lineages, it leads up to something impressive. And then usually the present day person is the most impressive and so forth. But here it sets you up kind of like in Ezekiel. It sets you up to expect something great, but then David just fails. Now yeah. we're, we're in exile in Babylon. So that didn't go so well. Right, and then we, we asked the Lord for a king, he gave us one, and here's where we ended up. And then the fact that we have to then hear about a third of the genealogy about being an exile, they were kings who were not kings. Mm -hmm. um, so you had an Israelite who was not an Israelite, Ruth, but then you had an Israelite who was not an Israelite, David, in that he did not follow Torah. And then you had kings who are not kings in the end. So. The fact that we have to listen to a genealogy of after the exile is very strange. Who's keeping track of these kings? And why? It's like every year in Paris, there are these parades and marches of the aristocracy who are left over from before Louis XIV and the French Revolution. But then you have the aristocracy from the Napoleonic line. And then they have these scuffles and everybody laughs at them because nobody cares who's king anyway. Exactly. They only care for themselves. And so everyone laughs at how these aristocrats fight against these aristocrats over something that's irrelevant, the kingship of France. Right. Well, and I'm sure that there's some support groups somewhere in Russia that want to bring back the Romanovs. I mean, it never ends. So on that level, you can always imagine some poor fool trying to figure out who's the true king of Israel. And maybe in a way this text is playing on that stupidity. I'm sure it is because in the beginning, in the first verse, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David... Okay, But then when you get to the end, it's the thing that you mentioned in your book, the thing that's bugged me for a long time. This is the genealogy of Joseph. Right. <laughs> it ends with Joseph. Right. And it's following the seed, the Zerah in Hebrew, right? It's the sperm, the seed, but it's also posterity, your descendants, those who come after you. And this is not about sexism or males versus females. It's simply a way of accounting 
as a way to think about it for those of you who might be offended by this idea. They simply measured generations or tracked generations by following the male line. It's an important context to understand. You could just as easily do it a different way. It doesn't matter. This was their accounting system. It's following that seed all the way through. But the father of Jesus is not from that seed. It's a different seed. It's striking at the very end. Joseph is the son of David, according to genealogy. Correct. Jesus is only adopted into that line because Joseph is basically the foster father of Jesus. Because Jesus' father is the one who impregnated Mary. Now you could say that God was merciful to the line of David and rescued it the same way he keeps rescuing all the genealogies in the Bible by producing his son with his Zerah, but then allowing his son to be adopted by the line of David. Grafted in. Right, so that's how you can say that he is the son of David and at the same time he isn't the son of David because this adoption is functional in a way. It reminds me of the paradigm too from Haggai when Haggai has the discussion if you have something that's clean, that's holy, and it touches a garment and that garment touches something, does it make it holy? No, it doesn't. If you have something that's unclean and it touches a garment and that garment touches that thing, will it make it unclean? Yes. So what happens is that that which is unclean perpetuates itself. That which is clean cannot perpetuate itself. You have to have an action come in to somehow miraculously make that which is unclean clean. And so that's exactly what you're saying, Father, is that we have this new seed that's grafted into the line of David, which has shown itself to be unclean, to be impure, to be weak. I mean, a third of the line was in Babylon, in captivity, let alone all the ones that were under the Greeks, under the Romans, which aren't mentioned here, but it's all in captivity. And so it has to be the case that the only way this line can be saved is if God intervenes directly. And I think this is where the creation narrative of the Bible differs in a very fundamental way from the common creation narratives of the ancient world. Typically in a creation narrative, a creation story, and one that comes to mind very specifically is the Babylonian narratives about Tiamat and her spouse and so forth. But all of these different creation stories begin with a sexual act because the stories are written in such a way that the writer is projecting the natural world on the heavens and then imagining a human seed, a human logos. Well, if you have life, you have to have a male and a female. But the sex act in that context is taking place within the created realm. So what scripture does is it systematically dynamites this classical paradigm in the ancient world because God the Father, who is the progenitor who provides the seed, is coming from the outside. He is not functioning within creation. He produces creation. I mean, he produces it asexually. It's a big deal. And it has to do not again with gender, but with the uh, systematic attempt by Scripture to emasculate humanity in the mind of the hearer. That's why I think it's important not just to hear the critique of humanity when you're exegeting Scripture, but to realize that Scripture is deconstructing our anthropocentrism. So in, on the one hand, in Genesis, you have this dynamiting of the classical paradigm of the creation myth, basically making the human seed immaterial. But at the same time that it devalues the human being, it lifts up or puts rather on the same level as the human being all of the other creatures. Right. So this is the backdrop for this text. And you cannot receive the life-giving word from God, his instruction, his teaching, personified in Jesus Christ who carries his teaching to the nations. You can't hear it if you still expect something to come from David's sperm. It doesn't work. The ancient world, I mean the ancient Romans, they knew plenty of stories about gods coming down and impregnating women who then had half God, half human sons who then went on to be great kings that we read about in the Iliad. This happened. We know that this happened. So this story was something that existed. The question is, and I know where you're headed, how and in what way does this story differ from those stories and therein lies the rub? It's similar to what I was saying about Genesis. Well, and the thing is, is that when you have in the Greek stories, they become a great king 
And then they're the ones who have really good relations with the gods and therefore are able to gain the power and strength and victory and honor that would be due someone who's just below a god. Whereas here, this is the production of a half man, half god being who would go on to be crucified. So this is the beginning. This is of, not Hercules' story. No, it's the opposite of Hercules' story. Hercules died a hero in strength. Now, Hercules was betrayed. Jesus was betrayed. But Jesus died with no honor, with no strength, with no victory, even actively turning those things down. And this is what's significant. We have a king who's going to be an anti-king and we have a kingly genealogy here, which is an anti-kingly genealogy. So he's the son of David to save the line of David from itself because it's hopelessly corrupt. Right. But by a king who's going to appear to be the most dishonored, the most criminal of all kings. And in that way, it undermines our understanding of victory also. It undermines kingship. When you have a kingly line like this and you have the son of David like this, it's not the son of David that you think. And so it starts off the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But what is the point of the book? The point of the book is so that you actually understand what is the Messiah. Jesus has this discussion in the market with the Pharisees. Who is the Messiah? What does it mean to be the son of David? What does it mean to be the one in the lineage of the king, the true lineage of the king. And what does it mean to be a son of Abraham? Again, this is the fight Jesus eventually has with the Pharisees. So the first chapter here, even beginning with the first verse, are setting up the questions that Matthew and the rest of the New Testament are going to have to wrestle with in order to understand what is Jesus. The question of who is Jesus is not come when Jesus asked Peter the question, who do you say that I am? That isn't where it comes. It comes here in verse 1 of chapter 1 where it tells us he is the son of David, but not the son of David. He is the Messiah, but not the Messiah that you think, and the son of Abraham, but not the way you're expecting. So for all of you out there who are having a crisis over whether or not you should say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays, or who are fighting with people over whether or not Christmas has been taken out of the department store, take stock of which Messiah you think you're defending or even attacking, because I'll bet you every Christmas gift under your vain, money-loving trees that you're not talking about the Jesus Christ that is enumerated in this genealogy. So on that note, we wish all of you, from all of us at the Bible as Literature podcast, a very excellent holiday Christmas season. <laughs> Happy holiday Christmas season to you too. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye, Father. The Bible as Literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.